Hello, everyone. We're just going to take a few minutes until we can see that all the attendees have gotten into the webinar so we don't start without any of you. And just to let you know as well, at the bottom of the screen, there is a little Q&A icon. So if you do want to ask questions, please pop them into the Q&A rather than the chat so we can keep track of them. A very warm welcome to everyone present today, and we thank you for taking some time out for this uh, for on Earth Day. And we know you all all uh, have shared a very busy schedule, but I am sure it will not fall short of some excitement today because among us we have some amazing speakers and some amazing panelists who are just gonna take and make precious the time you're going to spend today. So as, as you know, the event today is basically an exchange of minds between two countries, UK and India, on the laws to protect IUCN red listed species. Uh, Earth Day, as we know it, uh, falls on the 22nd of April, which is today. And this year's theme focuses on natural processes and emerging green technologies and innovative thinking that can restore the world's ecosystems. The International Union for Conservation of, Nat of Nature's Red List of species, Threatened Species has evolved to become the world's most comprehensive information source on the global extinction risk status of animal, fungus, and plant species. The bad news, however, is that biodiversity is declining. Currently, there are more than 134,400 species on the IUCN Red List, with more than 37,400 species threatened with extinction including 41% amphibians, 34% conifers, 33% of reef building corals, 26% of mammals, and 14% of birds. Uh, while, while going through this discussion, we do have a Q&A session below as directed by Tiffany. All attendees can pop their question into the box and it will be directed to the speakers at the end of the, uh, while we approach the end of the event by my colleague. Now, introducing the speakers for the day, we have with us a very special guest, if you know, Ms. Gauri Moliki is a very well-known um, animal rights activist based in India. She is a consultant in animal welfare laws and trustee of People for Animals, India's largest animal welfare organization, where she has led successful campaigns of animal rights, the biggest of which include the cam uh, campaign against the practice of sacrificial slaughtering of cattle. She has been also felicitated and recognized by the government multiple times and was recently awarded the Nari Shakti Puraskar, the highest civilian award for women in India in 2018. We thank you, ma'am, for joining us today and we're so, we're so grateful for you to take some time off. Thank you for organizing this and thank you for having me. It's wonderful to be able to interact with so many of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our second uh, speaker and panelist today is also an amazing person. He has founded the Save the Asian Elephants, a coalition of politicians, academics, lawyers, field experts and campaigners working to protect the Asian elephant from abuse and extinction. He has addressed many influential audiences on the issues arising and solutions formulated by SDAE in Liazia with specialists in India, the UK and worldwide. He also speaks and publishes widely on issues relating to animal welfare in the context of food production, distribution and retail, in, and problems associated with livestock supply chain. In 2018, Duncan was named a winner of the Animal Hero of the Year Award at the Animal Star Awards, which attracted 850 nominations nationally. Thank you, Duncan, for joining us. We're so grateful to have, uh, have you here with us. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you so much, Ariane, and especially to be in my in the midst of my alma mater of Bristol University. Um, so thank you very much. A pleasure to be here and to talk, especially on the world's Earth Day. Thank you, Duncan. Now, UK Centre for Animal Law has helped us to organise and address this such a glaring issue to you. And we would thank <coughs> Ms. Paula Fox chairperson and trustee, UK Centre for Animal Law. Paula is the chairperson of the UK Centre for Animal Law. He was previous in practice as a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers. 
Paula has an interest in animal law and regularly lectures and writes on topics around animal law and policy. She is currently a visiting lecturer at the University of Winchester, where she teaches animal law and policy. She also has experience in the voluntary sector, where she worked prior to starting independent practice as a barrister. And we could not thank more uh, Tiffany, who has supported us all through this uh, project and all through uh, organizing this event. Um, she uh, provided, provided us with student support and she's a legal support officer and providing a legal support for ALOS other project policy and educative work. She is from Newfoundland, Canada, and she graduated from Memorial University of Newfoundland with a BA in Law and Society and German with a certificate in criminology. She then graduated 2018 with a law degree from the University of Leicester. She is a recipient of the Advancement of Animal Law Scholarship awarded by the Animal Legal Defense Fund, a US animal law charity. Uh, Tiffany also founded and chaired the UK's first SALDF student society at Leicester University Law School. She aspires to use her legal education to create change in the field of animal protection law. Thank you, Tiffany and uh, Paula for helping us organize this. We're so grateful for you to uh, make us propagate this uh, event actually to people, make them know about the glaring issues. Thank you so much. Now, moving on to the discussion, I think, uh, I, I would like to direct my first question to Ms. Moleki. Um, now, talking about IUCN red listed species, um, according to you, what has been the Indian government's approach and the legislature's approach to impose protection and look after welfare of such species uh, which have been less, uh, uh, listed under the red list of the IUCN? Um, well, after 1972, when we promulgated the Wildlife Protection Act in India, um, I'd say we've not really had any landmark uh, legislation made for the conservation of wildlife in India. And uh, the execution, the enforcement of it has only been uh, on the downslide, especially in the past few years where development and, uh, you know, exports and mining and all kinds of uh, uh, urbanization has been given a big boost. So I'd say while we have a good set of laws to begin with, which would have been adequate and would have saved a lot of these species from uh, getting into the IUCN red list uh, to begin with, we have uh, failed uh, our wildlife on, enfor on the enforcement bit. Uh, the safeguards and the checks that were placed way back in 1972 in the Wildlife Protection Act, such as the National Advisory Board on Wildlife, the state advisory boards, uh, which are chaired by the chief ministers and the prime minister, have hardly met. They have hardly, uh, you know, taken cognizance of, of these issues. Even CITES, a treaty that we have been a founder signatory of, uh, we don't have a corresponding uh, legislation for it in the country. Hence, such species caught within uh, inland in the country uh, can hardly be prosecuted because there is an absence of a law. They can only be caught at the ports. Um, so far as uh, critically endangered species go, uh, some lip service is done in states, but uh, I would say that it's hardly enough. And uh, the situation's pretty grim when it comes to uh, red listed species in India. Uh, I, I think there are some suggestions that have been put forth even before the Honorable Supreme Court in India, um, getting expert committees together, having a roadmap, having short term, medium term, long term goals, um, putting veterinary minds together. Uh, it seems the, that the governments both at the central and state level are reluctant to take on um, conservation at the cost of urbanization. Uh, hence, it, it, it's a it, it's not a rosy picture from here. Um, especially if I may talk about the elephants. Uh, while uh, Asiatic elephants are on the red list, uh, there are only about, you know, a good uh, optimistic figure would be about 30,000 of them in the wild. Uh, and we continue to poach them. We continue to trap them uh, for purposes of tourism and religious uh, uh, purposes, such as temples in Kerala, Tamil Nadu, the states which have uh, which have a lust for uh, captive elephants. And uh, uh, even despite uh, the 1972 legislation uh, banning any kind of uh, uh, trapping or you know captivity. Mm -hmm. of 
fresh captivity of elephants, uh, we still see that there are states such as Assam, Orissa, Bihar, where still a lot of trapping happens. And uh, it is hardly something. I mean, maybe you'd miss a fishing cat somewhere, but you cannot, uh, you know, ignore or be oblivious of uh, elephants being trapped. Uh, you know, huge animals being trapped in um, in the forests of uh, Assam and Kaziranga, etc., where uh, they are transported either to Rajasthan if it's a female elephant for tourism of uh, at Amir or some such fort, or uh, if it's a male, it goes off to uh, to Kerala to be kept in captivity for life uh, in chains and uh, you know worshipped. For, uh, for some very strange reason. That's, I think, the decline. There has to be a, a, a mindset. Uh, there has to be a lot of uh, outreach that needs to be done while everybody wants to save the tiger. There has to be more awareness about other species. There are 150 species that are critically in, endangered now on the red list and in India. And uh, uh, most people, an average Indian would not be able to tell you five names out of those. So I'd say that the concern of the government is less because awareness among people is very little. And uh, the stress is mostly, uh, while the legislations are all there, uh, the Wildlife Protection Act in itself uh, is pretty strong. In fact, uh, it, cla it classifies national parks, sanctuaries, tiger reserves, etc., as sacrosanct spaces. And and for nature, it's um, it's best left alone. If you just leave these spaces by themselves, uh, most species, and I'm sure Duncan would know so much more about it, and other experts would. Uh, perhaps worked hands-on with wildlife. Uh, my uh, belief, my very strong belief is that if you just let spaces be, nature takes care of itself. Uh, but it's the human intervention, it's the mining, it's constant fragmentation. The entire North India, uh, right from the foot of the Himalayas in the Himachal Pradesh to the Northeastern regions was a consistent forest earlier, um, running, in, uh, running into thousands of kilometers where the elephant, you know, the, the wild elephants, their social groups would, uh, would walk, you know, uh, every year they would have their, um, you know, roots which were very set and they would mate with, um, you know, they interact with other groups and have a large gene pool, which would then give them sturdy offsprings. Now with the fragmentation of these forests, uh, the, these even though we might save them in numbers, uh, but their entire, the incest breeding, the kind of uh, gene pool that they had subjected to now, uh, it doesn't seem as if uh, this, this would last many more generations. We are totally on a downslide unless we immediately form corridors. Uh, we have agitated this matter before the Honorable Supreme Court as well. Um, the matter of corridors, the matter of captive elephants, uh, and to stop um, you know, trapping of wild elephants, the babies that are exported to all kinds of tourism places. Uh, it just seems, everything seems to take too long. So um, it's all in the process, but the uh, situation isn't really too good. So ma'am, you talk about how leaving the nature as it is, and there has been such wide scale of deforestation uh, due to industrialization, which causes the ha natural habitat of these animals to actually reduce uh, to that extent, which is what is causing a redless species to extend that much. Ma'am, what do you think the government can do, like they have the power to do it. They have created legislation to do it, but have they not executed it? Do you think there's any reform would you think help cater these welfare of these uh, species and extend their uh, life span or increase uh, more of those species and get them out of the red list? Has the government tried to do something or do you think they can do something according to your view? See a government in any country doesn't come from anywhere else. It is an extension of us. We get the government we deserve. So a majority of people in the country do not really uh, find this really important, which is the frustrating bit. 
uh, like I said, not many people will be able to tell you uh, that uh, how many species are endangered or whether the Asiatic elephant is on the red list at all, or what is IUCN, or, or whether it needs to be, whether conservation would even make any sense. Even among animal welfare people, we'd find uh, a lot of sensitization about welfare, but they don't see that as a distinct concept from conservation. So uh, while if we talk about rescue centers and uh, you know stopping animal use in zoos or, or, or circuses, there would be a lot of, it would be emotive for a lot of people. But when uh, we talk, or, or if it's one single tiger getting, uh, you know, um, destroyed because if it's allegedly turned into a man eater it would become an emotive issue for the entire country but a whole species going downhill somehow does not evoke that kind of emotion not in the people hence not in the government i would not point finger towards any politician because we vote him, voted him in. And if he is not, uh, if a party is coming into power that does not have a mandate of conservation of forests and wildlife, uh, then who is at fault? So I'd uh, uh, just say that, well, uh, more and more outreach, more and more education needs to happen within people. That is when the voice uh, of all these educated people will reach the government quarters. Uh, otherwise, if we keep asking for more and more roads and houses and factories and mines, well, that's what they're going to deliver. So uh, th that's how I see it. Thank you so much, ma'am, for that. It's actually true because industrialization has caused loss of so, so many habitats and it's actually made it difficult for the people to actually say anything against it because the population is increasing too and industrialization is an effect of population. Um, on this moment, I would like to take the opportunity to direct a question to Mr. McNair, um, uh, because Ms. Moleki did speak on uh, elephants, the captive elephants and um, how uh, the government's not basically looking forward to implement or execute the legislation and protection of such elephants. Ms. McNair has uh, made, uh, introduced and is the chairperson of the foundation, which actually main motive is uh, save the Asian elephants, uh, which is a major, major um, uh, species present, present in the IUCN red list. Um, we would like to hear from Mr. McNair about how, what, what are the achievements that STAE strives to achieve and what are its proposals uh, to the government or uh, to what, what do they strive to achieve? Thank you very much, Arian. Yes, and, and I, I thank you for the question. Um, well, I founded Stay six years ago, um, and I did so out of uh, a, a horror, a horror at uh, uh, informing myself of the basic facts that surround uh, the terrible treatment and depletion of this precious species, the Asian elephant, in its different subspecies. And that in turn had followed from various visits that I made um, to Southeast Asia, notably to India itself and the subcontinent, and the unspeakable horrors that I saw. I want to make very clear, firstly, that India, in my estimation, is a wonderful country. It is extraordinary. It shows today uh, its long legacy of 10,000 years or more of tolerance uh, and understanding of other cultures and so on. But like all countries, and certainly including my own country, the United Kingdom, uh, it has problems. And the treatment, not only in India, but across the remaining range states of Southeast Asia of the Asian elephants is truly awful. And I want to uh, let people know who don't that um, at the heart of everything Stay does, at the heart of it, the mainspring um, and the center point is raising public awareness. Um, for all the reasons that Maleki quite rightly addressed, uh, raising public awareness is critical whether you inhabit a country that operates under a functioning democracy or not. I also believe that um, the problems for the Asian elephants are essentially man-made. 
They are not God ordained. There is nothing uh, deterministic about it. And that what man does wrong by his own hand, he can put right again. But we must hurry in the case of Asian elephants. And um, just very briefly, for those who may not know, the sad uh, and pretty much ubiquitous rite of passage of a baby uh, elephant in the wild is to be uh, is to be illegally poached into captivity. Often the mother who tries to protect it and members of its herd are killed um, who, who uh, interfere in that process. Uh, the baby is taken away, isolated, starved and, and malnourished and, 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 and dehydrated, kept awake for long periods by great noise and then beaten and stabbed. And for those who doubt it, uh, they should spend two or three minutes online looking for themselves uh, and we have an abundance of photographic library and so on to show it. I've seen it myself, it's dreadful. And the way thereafter elephants are treated throughout their captive lives likewise is awful. Now, this is not um, a slight upon India, absolutely not. I would say the major players in this catastrophe are the very powerful um, Western travel industry, tour industry, and indeed from beyond, from China and so on, who make really big money out of unethical tourism. And the, um, the solutions are complex because India and the other range states in their different ways, of course, themselves have complexities and serious sensitivities. Uh, but, but, there are certain things that undoubtedly we can do. They are all predicated upon huge public awareness. That is essential. And Maliki quite rightly talks about the apparent lassitude and indifference, perhaps, of many in the wonderful country of India, 1.3 billion people, um, who don't always seem to get the point or care. That's been exactly the same in many countries across the world, certainly in the UK. Things have changed and are changing and must change. Um, and they are changing in the UK, big public awareness. And that then must, must link to credible, coherent, attainable policies for change. Now, they will differ in different countries, quite obviously. And in our country, in the UK, we don't operate, of course, only in the UK, we operate uh, seeking to cast a net across the world, uh, not only to the uh, Southeast Asian range states, but everywhere that has an interest in the welfare uh, of our own environment. Um, and it, it, in, in terms of the UK, we have, of course, in the UK, autonomy and jurisdiction over our own affairs. So um, I, I'm happy to go on to talk about what I know of the scene in India, which I've now visited many times, and of the political issues and the legislative problems, uh, the, the issues of failure to implement these excellent laws, like the 1972 Wildlife Protection Act that Malik has mentioned, and indeed the pre previous to that Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, 1960. Uh, these are mighty good pieces of legislation on paper. The problem is they are uh, enforced in, in a kind of lumpy and, 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 and um, inconsistent way across the country for lots of political and perhaps business reasons. Uh, in the UK, uh, we do generally have a very strong regard for the rule of law, generally. And Stay has focused a great deal of its firepower and its growing influence on new legislation. And the legislation that we um, assert and avow that should happen is a new law to ban the advertising, sale, or promotion in any way of unethical Asian elephant-related venues. Let's just step back. Um, in recent years, the UK has sent over one million um, tourists or uh, visitors to India, just to India, forget about all the other dozen or so range states. Every year, a very large proportion go uh, to see elephants and the wonder of elephants. Um, inevitably, though, sadly, captive elephants. Um, 
Take, for example, Thailand. On the latest available figures, there were 13 million uh, elephant rides in Thailand um, two or three years ago. These are enormous figures. So tourism is a really big and live issue. Uh, it, there are other issues, loss of natural habitat, of course, and, and loss of corridors and such like. But tourism is something that's on our doorstep that we can influence. And Stay has done everything it can over the years of its existence to engage government, to engage the travel industry. And we are now, with the big numbers that are rallying to our standard, um, making headway in getting towards new law. We believe there will be new law in the UK very, very soon. Now, that new law is one thing. And, and of course, Britain, for its mighty past, does not cast the same um, influence across the world, India or elsewhere, as it used to do. But it is a start. It is uh, the beginning of the beginning. Uh, because the law that we put forward, and we've been asked by our government to provide a draft bill for presentation to Parliament, we've done that, that's been considered. That is a template, in our view. It is wholly transposable to most other countries, and certainly to democracies, to functioning democracies, where proper open debate can happen in the public eye, and everyone can express a vote. Um, uh, their own view through a vote. And that law is short and fairly simple. It will need uh, additional backup um, statutory instruments and so on to, to, to give detail and, and flesh to it. Uh, but its essential ingredients are, the, um, are a ban uh, enforced by real sanctions and fines pe and other penalties on those, whether they're tour companies or anyone else, who advertises UEVs, unethical elephant venues. You may be shocked to know that presently, Stay has exposed well over 1,000 companies in the UK advertising UEVs, um, advertising hundreds of UEVs through thousands and thousands of advertisements. And that number has not diminished during the lockdown. It has steadily increased. And we believe those are moderate and conservative figures. So it's a really, really big problem. And it's one that for which there is good legal precedent that we are not telling India how to behave in the way that I'm afraid some charities who sometimes should know better really are tending to do because that's a forlorn ambition. But we are saying to our own people, um, you know, this, first of all, these are the horrors. This is what is happening. Um, and this is how you um, must have nothing to do with it. We seek, of course, to stem the flow of knowledge of these dreadful places that are so often misrepresented anyway uh, through advertising uh, and leaving people, leaving um, ethical sanctuaries. There's a growing, although not big enough, movement towards genuine ethical sanctuaries whose essential ingredient is that elephants um, live in a, as naturalistic a state as consistent with safety and security, and where they can be seen from a respectful distance exhibiting natural behavior in a herd environment. Now, um, all of those ingredients generally are absent from the vast majority of facilities that certainly I've visited and that my colleagues have, uh, both in India and beyond. Um, the sad, tip what typifies most uh, of the UEVs Elephants um, have been brutally uh, broken down. Um, uh, they are then chained or roped or held down in unnatural positions, not moving for decades sometimes, decades. Um, and where they are routinely abused uh, through stabbing, um, through um, uh, all manner of uh, beatings and so on, uh, where they're malnourished, where they stand forever in their own waste and, 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 and you know, discarded uh, rubbish food and so on and where they are pressed into relentless service um, for tricks, riding, football, all manner of unnatural activities. Um, here's another thing. Elephants are wild animals. Under zoo regulations observed by the Secretary of State in the UK, the most dangerous animals held in zoos are crocodiles, tigers, lions, and one other, elephants. 
uh, they are the uh, designated the most dangerous animals. And yet, when you go uh, to a, a range state, you can freely, and in fact, you're encouraged to hop on the back of an elephant uh, and to ride it. Um, it's been broken down and brutalized to admit its uh, people on its back. Uh, and so elephants are deadly in that they launch fatal attacks, but also they are highly effective transmitters of deadly airborne viruses like TB, the world's biggest virus killer, kills millions every year. Also Ebola, also SARS, and also a, a growing body of scientific evidence suggests COVID-19. And this in a country, India, which is struggling, struggling, to overcome the virus, which today announced another 315,000 cases in 24 hours. Um, the travel industry, the Western world, no one should be inflicting these problems on uh, people who visit uh, these hell holes uh, and on the elephants themselves. Um, they should be held at a safe and respectful distance. So our law our putative law, we hope it will be a law, seeks to address all those points. Um, and as I've said, um, well, I speak in the European Parliament a certain amount, uh, as well as the Westminster Parliament, and I am very keen and stay is doing this to pursue um, uh, the um, implementation of similar legislation in various other countries. Um, and so this is the cornerstone. It's not the only policy of stay. We have others which I'm happy to develop. But these are, we believe, very important policies that we can achieve without the concurrence of the state in which the problems are happening. Um, you know, we, we, we in London cannot march over to uh, or sail over to India, plant the Union Jack in a nearby mound and proclaim to the world, this is how you must treat your animals. No. It's not right, it's not proper, it's ineffectual, it's probably even dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and yet we can do everything to influence our own uh, uh, population's uh, commercial habits and activities. So that, that, that's a summary of what we're seeking uh, to do uh, in terms of legislation. We have other policies, they involve joint Anglo-Indian, particularly Anglo-Indian, um, initiatives um, for the establishment of ethical, uh, an ethical elephant sanctuary, jointly funded by the two governments, um, of an ethical Mahout training center that proceeds on positive reinforcement principles, no beating and thrashing and all the rest, if animals, if elephants have to be taken into uh, captivity for commercial exploitation. And very importantly, it includes a policy of exchange of vets and veterinary students um, between the two countries to gain by mutual benefit from each other's expertises and experiences. The, these are the key policies of stay at the moment. Um, as we grow and as our governance gets ever more eminent and larger, we have discussions about other things we can be doing, but we've got to stay focused on the key ones uh, and those are they. Um, thank you, Mr. McNair, for that. As we know that STA has been um, increasing and striving to achieve its aim. As you've said, it's been, it's been slowly, slowly increasing in the trying to, and, and it has been being helped by the governments. So you've worked with many of the governments, uh, which, which I think my colleague was mentioning. Do you think there are any, uh, any difficulties in communicating with the government or the government refrains from actually uh, extending their support towards the cause you are striving to achieve? Well, there are. Uh, I, I, the governments we've chiefly worked with at Stay are the UK government, but in fact it started with the Indian government. I sought out and was very honoured to be received uh, by the uh, by um, cabinet ministers of Mr Modi in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, and also by others such uh, eminent eminences such as Manika Gandhi, um, and we had really good discussions. Um, there is, however, uh, you, you know, uh, I mean, India, uh, which I have uh, unallayed um, respect for, um, is a complex country with any number of issues at any one time, and it is difficult to in to um, 
engage uh, and enthuse people uh, to the issue to, to this issue that we regard as so important. Uh, and indeed, the you know why are elephants important? Let's say to India. Well, for a start, they represent part of India's extraordinary, rich, wondrous natural heritage. They are beautiful creatures, and they stand as mega gardeners of the forests, as many of my conservation uh, colleagues on stay refer to them. They are a super keystone species. It is they, above any other species, that sustains and nourishes the forests uh, of the subcontinent and beyond by their activities. So they're important in that way. Uh, they're important, frankly, in economic terms. I've, I've touched on the, the enormous numbers of uh, tourists that flock to see elephants wherever they are. Uh, they shouldn't do so when they're captive and brutalized in the way they are, but nonetheless they do. That's another pretty good reason why they are and should be important to the host country. But also, also, in the eyes of the world, any country that systematically or permits the systematic, most gruesome abuse of highly sensitive, highly intelligent, precious, and I'm prepared to say compassionate creatures, and I can tell you much about that, uh, should not be held up ever higher in the esteem of the world. They should not. And so it is a profound issue. Um, what is the legacy of the Prime Minister of India who oversees the extirpation finally of the last wild elephant? What is his legacy to the world? And so for all these reasons and others, elephants are and should be important. Now, um, the government, uh, of course, as one would expect at the highest level uh, in India, was very uh, uh, pleased to see us, understood the issues, I don't think were regarded um, uh, it, it necessarily displayed close attention, both incidentally in, in Delhi and in our meetings with the High Commission um, of, of India in London. Uh, but they are increasingly doing so. Um, the, um, it is a race against time. Uh, 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 Maleki is quite right that optimistically we're looking at 30 to 35,000 Asian elephants left in the wild. That's actually a minuscule number. You know, there used to be millions of elephants in China alone. It's now got two or 300 elephants left. Um, and of course, if you clubbed all 30,000 together in a, in, in a single state in close range, that's fine. But it's not so. They're stretched out over enormous distances. And elephants have to travel huge distances, not just to forage, but to interact with other herds, to crossbreed, to maintain genetic strength and to resist diseases and so on. And when their numbers are so slender and their roots are so blocked by failing corridors um, and, and, and uh, intrusive, reckless developments and uh, re uh, deforestation and um, destruction of natural crops in favor of unsustainable palm oil and so on. Um, all of these things dreadfully impact on the possibilities of the population regenerating itself. And um, so these, uh, the, these are complex issues and they have to be uh, got over. And, and as, uh, as has been said, it's got to become more of a priority in India. Now, stay, which has got growing influence, um, cannot turn the Indian government to its will. Um, and so we focus terribly hard on what everyone else can do. Um, we've spoken, therefore, to the UK government intensively. I had a meeting with the Prime Minister's officials, the 12th in a year, yesterday. And we have another meeting with the key Department of State tomorrow. Uh, and this is going on all the time. We are urging the cause of the Asian elephants and everything Britain can do about it. Um, and there are many opportunities. Um, we're talking hard about, um, uh, about the new law. Now, you, you, you ask about, uh, I think, about challenges and about difficulties. And there are plenty. And they start, of course, with huge vested interests. Uh, it's very sad, but it's axiomatic to say that when you have an entrenched problem, you follow the money. And how true that is here, that the tour industry is enormous. 
uh, most, very sadly to say, most of the really big travel companies, um, certainly in the UK, are selling these sorts of unethical venues. Uh, and so they are a mighty lobby upon government, um, even though we have tried to demonstrate to the public that they should not exert uh, their, their presence uh, in this way over the public too much. Um, they are, uh, you know, they have a deep pocket. Uh, they have years of experience of public relations. Uh, we have locked horns and do every day with the big companies and those who represent them. Uh, and it's a hard battle, but we believe we are really making progress. And as I said, ultimately, in a functioning democracy, um, it is uh, the public who must speak um, for change. That's why everyone must know about this. Everyone must know about this. Um, I've, I've given hundreds and hundreds of speeches I, to every kind of constituency, um, you know, whether it's the European Parliament, whether it's Westminster, uh, whether it's huge veterinary schools and universities and colleges, big business meetings, um, Hindu temples, um, Christian churches, and so on. And very, very rarely do I find at the end of an address that people say, look, I'm now acquainted with the essential facts. I've given it thought. I do believe it's a good idea to beat and kill baby elephants in the name of tourism profits. Now, the fact that I've, you know, that Stays had to stir up public opinion in this way is a sad legacy of the success, I'm sorry to say, of much of the, not all, but much of the travel industry in suppressing the terrible truth about the plight of Asian elephants. Um, and, it, it's, and yet it's been the mainspring to everything. And so whilst the battle goes on, whilst we are not regarding anything as in the can, most certainly not, and whilst politics is an uncertain game, as is the legislative process in, in Whitehall and Westminster, uh, we see signs of promise. Um, and as I said before, it's not the it's not the end of matters if we get a law. It's not even the beginning of the end. It's the beginning of the beginning. And I'm so pleased, and I know this to be so. I mean, our enormous petition, which has now got 1.1 million supporters and another 32 million petition signatories from other petitions aligning with ours, uh, which incidentally is many, many times more than anyone who's ever voted for anything else in Britain, including, I, I might say, Brexit and anti-Brexit. Um, people are starting to get the message and government is starting to respond. And I believe in large part, the travel industry is realizing it must, its wings are being clipped against the wrong things. But it can make money in ethical elephant tourism and we encourage all those who do it uh, in that uh, venture. But so we've had a very, uh, we've had, of course, very different responses from government. Uh, to begin with, it was almost, what's an Asian elephant? Um, now it's, um, well, can we talk about the detail of your policies and your legislation? Now that's not a uniform response, but it's starting uh, to, to rear its head much more. I see no reason from, uh, knowledge of all our friends across Europe and beyond, and we know from our petition that people in every country of the world support us. I see no reason why it should be different in any country once the facts are out, um, any, any, any functioning democracy. Of course, if a government turns its face on principle and the, the population is chilled uh, or, or uh, fearful of expressing uh, a, 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 a uniform view, things will be far, far slower uh, if ever they change. But we see real prospects. Um, we see real prospects aligning at the moment. It's a critical time. Um, thank you, Mr. McNair, for that and sharing such an amazing discussion with uh, our attendees. I think it's something quite to learn from the foundation you've uh, actually established. And actually, it actually focuses on the, the discussion we have today between India and UK. Um, STA has been tirelessly working towards the cause of protecting Asian elephants. And Ms. Moleki, you have dealt with several cases involving captive elephants. Um, would you please uh, shed some light on that 
uh, to attendees because at least I, as a law student, um, know about how, what impact you bring to India, especially the case of Gauri Modeki versus Union of India. The times you have gone against the government to bring something special for the animals and do it for the ecosystem and the animals. So we are a very special entity for, the Indi uh, for India in general because uh, you've done so much to protect the animals, even the acts and statutes you've brought through from your campaigns and activism. Could you shed some light on uh, the capital sense part? So basically, when the people and the governments fail us, then we have the third pillar of democracy, which is the judiciary, where we have to go because there is no other option left. And that's what we did when um, basically there's a state called Uri, uh, uh, Bihar, uh, which is on the eastern side, where all captive elephants from the northeast uh, were brought in, you know, the recently broken ones, like Duncan just explained, when they catch, when they trap these babies, they starve them, beat them, keep them away from, uh, you know, uh, their herd. Of course, the herd is killed if they come to rescue it. And um, then once the, the spirit of the elephant of the calf is broken, uh, then it would be brought to a place called Sonpur Fair, a cattle market, um, where it would be sold or auctioned off. Uh, so way back in 2014, I had the misfortune of visiting that fair and uh, these absolutely gorgeous, majestic creatures, we don't, we are not worthy of them. And uh, they were made to stand up all, all four legs chained and, uh, you know, with a price tag on each one. And uh, they were being sold off to uh, temples in Kerala or maybe the fort people, you know, the, the uh, people who ply these tourism uh, trips in Amir Fort in Jaipur. Um, well, we documented all of that, went to the Bihar High Court and got uh, uh, that at all kind of wildlife from the Sonpur cattle market totally banned. In fact, there were lakhs, uh, lakhs and lakhs of uh, birds also that were traded there, along with a lot of other mammalian species, uh, which all got totally banned. Um, it's I wouldn't say it's stopped, it's gone under the carpet. At least it's not being celebrated and done in an organized manner as it was earlier. Maybe some scanty bits of the trade are still being carried out, uh, but at least now we have a high court order saying that it's totally illegal and cannot be done. Um, so that was one victory. Then in my home state, which is Uttarakhand in the foothills of the Himalayas, uh, we had uh, these, again, the tourists, although there's, there's this beautiful Jim Corbett National Park uh, where a lot of wild elephants can be seen by people and people go, uh, tourists go, are allowed to go inside and uh, spot a herd or two or a tusker here and a uh, calf over there, uh, which is the way it should be. But uh, Still, just outside on the periphery of the National Park, you'd find eight of these captive elephants, uh, you know, just being offered for rides and, uh, you know, people from abroad and Indians, uh, they'd pay a small amount to uh, get onto the back of these elephants. So that's an, another one thing that we uh, approached the High Court at Nenital for, and again, all eight were rescued. Now Uttarakhand does not have any elephants in private captivity. Um, the, my third state was Delhi, where there were six elephants in the capital city without paperwork. Uh, and then to own an elephant requires more paperwork than uh, you'd require, uh, you know, to own a, a car. But, uh, you know, you, you'd dare not drive without uh, an RC or a driving license. But um, these elephants have been here for decades and uh, they did not have ownership certificates as has been mandated in the Wildlife Protection Act or transit permits, again, mandated in Wildlife Protection Act. In fact, two of these elephants had tuberculosis and uh, the keepers and the people who were riding on them and the wedding festivals, and the wedding celebrations that they, these elephants were invited to or birthday parties that they were invited to um, were obviously ob completely oblivious of the fact. So, um, and they had, one of them had herpes. 
Um, so finally, we again had to go back to Delhi High Court and have these elephants removed. Some of them were sent to Haryana's rescue center, which is thankfully closed for visitors. Um, there are some rescue centers which run very un un unethically in India, and they are open for rescues for tourists, not only to come and see the uh, rescued elephants, but also to bathe with them and pet them, then what's the point? I uh, Anyway, so these, these elephants again were rescued. We still have three more states which are huge and we, which we are dealing with. Uh, one is, of course, Rajasthan, which is not even elephant habitat. That state does not have, elephants do not belong there. They don't belong in a, a desert. You cannot have enough water for people there let alone elephants. So um, that's one. And then there's Kerala, which is elephant habitat, but then they've chained them up by scores in temples like Guru Vayur and Padmanabha Swami, where uh, they, they are, and Duncan was right in saying, they've been standing there for years, they have not been opened. Like, isn't that the most appalling thing? Uh, these absolutely intelligent, magnificent creatures have gone mad. They, they have they show stereotypical behavior their hind limbs are have abscesses on them because they've just been you know defecating and urinating in the same place and uh, people can see them for five rupees uh, you know just a ticket of five rupees it's appalling and um, there then there is the whole beggar elephant issue uh, which they are in many many states Chhattisgarh. Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh, where uh, beggars would go out on elephants. They don't have the means to feed them well. They don't have the means to treat them properly, which brings me to the point of treating elephants again. Uh, Indian veterinary colleges do not have wildlife medicine as a, a, you know, a substantial or even a useful uh, segment, a chapter. So um, we have requested the Veterinary Council of India to revise the module and uh, the syllabus and have a proper module for wildlife uh, treatment, even when we have uh, zoonotic diseases such as tuberculosis. And there is a rescue center in Uttar Pradesh, which has a major outbreak of tuberculosis in elephants. They just keep it all hidden because they don't know what to do with it. So. Uh, you know, stuff like that. We have to have interchange of knowledge. And I'm so glad uh, that, uh, um, you know, there, there is now some sort of bridge between uh, India and other countries where we are exchanging knowledge, especially on veterinary medicine. Um, so for some things we go to court, we're still in court for about 80 things which we want for animal welfare, one of which is the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act, which does not have uh, enough penalties. It's just, um, 50 rupees, which is, uh, you know, how many pounds that is just 0.5 or something. But um, uh, the, there are some ways in which we try to, you know, interact with the government and uh, maybe obtain, you know, some cooperation, which at the lower ranks you would still see, but as you climb higher, the priorities of the government are very clear. Uh, we are giving rise to, we are just, promoting mining, we're promoting roads, national highways, metro projects. It's just, uh, wildlife doesn't seem to be, uh, it's just an impediment. In fact, the National Board of Wildlife only meets to approve projects and 70 projects approved in one meeting in which four people sit and decide the fate of the wildlife of this country. Uh, I don't think they even spent 30 seconds on each issue, uh, which they, with one stroke of a pen, it's death sentence to um, all our IUCN red listed species. Nobody cares about them. Uh, it's very heartbreaking, but it has to be more people. More people have to know and come forward and talk about it, which is I'm so happy you have this uh, discussion today. Um, I would also reflect on one point you made there about how elephants and animals just stand at temples. It's time, high time, I think, all, uh, all of us, all of our students or all of the people of India or anywhere in the world, they should know how animal lives matter too. And they, if they too have a mental health, don't they? Um, and now talking about laws, Ms. Moleki, yeah, I would also like to bring to the attention of the attendees that you introduce the prevention of cruelty to animals of the livestock markets, uh, where you spare, which was spearheaded by you. 
and uh, after you've gotten an order from the court, which regulates animal trade for slaughter and also mitigated cruel conditions for animals at the market. Do you think this made you go a step further to the aim you strive to achieve? What are you thinking forward for the animal welfare in India? These are the two questions I would like to ask. I didn't get your first question. Could you repeat that one? Um, it was, uh, do you think this act which you introduced made you go a step further towards the aim you strive to achieve? Yeah, okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, in 1960, uh, we had a really, really compassionate uh, member of parliament, uh, Rukmini Devi Arundel, who brought in a private member bill, which was then transformed into the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And it was pretty all right, uh, according to its, its own time. It replaced the 1870 18, Act. And it was uh, uh, pretty uh, strong in its penalties also. These 50 did mean something back then. And uh, it covered all kinds of situations, such as laboratories and performing animals and uh, you know animals that are uh, kept as pets, etc. But uh, with time, if, despite the rules having fleshed out the details from time to time, uh, we did require uh, for stronger penalties so that the law remains to have remains to be a deterrent. Uh, because as on today, it's a non-cognizable offense to kill an animal under the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals Act. And um, the penalty, if uh, the person's convicted is rupees 50. That's that's less money than traveling to the court. So it's meaningless. Uh, however, the Supreme Court had said three times, uh, not just in my petition, but tw two other times as well, uh, to for the parliament to revise the penalties. And this is really, really stretching. The court had really had to stretch themselves because there's a clear segregation of power. Uh, the court cannot direct the government to make a law, but uh, they did seem that uh, this this uh, regime was, you know, had to be changed. The 50 rupee uh, thing was just not making it. And, and it was a waste of time to even book these cases. Uh, it costs more to hire the police and judges than to prosecute a person for a crime of uh, 50 rupees. So it just didn't add up which is why the court had uh, said it thrice. Well, now the uh, honorable cabinet minister has agreed that he that they should uh, you know, change the penalties and upgrade them. We also got support from 150 members of parliament. Um, they all signed our petition. I think that counts for a lot uh, because it was such a genuine uh, and, and such a straightforward thing that you cannot have any act or any law which you recognize as a crime, recognize as a violation uh, of, of public order and morality, and then you penalize uh, a person for 50 rupees at the end of it. So now, uh, recently, a stakeholders meeting was also held. Now in the, they're in the process of crystallizing the final amendment, and I'm Ho I hope that's going to happen soon. Uh, again, no matter how what wonderful laws you make in this country, the um, essence is in the enforcement, for which again, we have to go back to court every time uh, to have monitored enforcement. For instance, when um, the largest animal sacrifice uh, event was being held in Nepal, we came to know in a neighboring country, about five lakh buffaloes would be hacked to buffaloes and you know goats and even pigeons would be hacked to death uh, to please some goddess. Uh, we discovered that all of these animals were being transported from India uh, because it's an open border and there's no check balance, nothing you could you know just drain out all your male buffaloes which are of no use to the dairy industry anyway and. Uh, saw their heads off to please some goddess. So like totally, you know, it's, it's a convenient way of getting rid of male buffaloes also. So we went to court. Uh, we could not uh, attack the jurisdiction of another country, but we could at least prevent the animals from being made to travel from India into another country for a purpose which was not, uh, you know, which was considered as an offense in our laws. Uh, so it was granted. Again, it was a bit of a stretch, but uh, it was granted. We won in the Supreme Court and 
the court did not stop there. They asked uh, for sustainable ways in which to have, uh, you know, a regime where this would be a self-correcting problem if it would correct itself. Um, so a committee was made and this committee was uh, asked to, um, you know, deliberate on the situation of livestock in the country and, uh, you know, how to uh, deal with trade, how to deal with transportation, uh, etc. And uh, we recommended that not only the livestock market rules should be made, but also, um, you know, rules should be made to deal with animals which are pending trial. Because what we had seen over the period of time was that when animals were seized by the police, the uh, you know they would be given back to the accused uh, immediately after upon notice, you know immediately as the case was booked, and um, that would defeat the entire purpose of the uh, of the act because animals would be seen as property instead of victims. So we could demonstrate before the court that animals are property are, are, are victims. Hence, their, their uh, uh, you know, uh, interest has to be safeguarded if there is an accused uh, person who is, uh, who may be, you know, causing harm to the animal, or if there is apprehension that left with the accused, the animal would come to, uh, would be in danger, uh, he should not be given back to the accused. So that, that bit of argument, uh, we were able to, um, to do in the Supreme Court. And we that's how we got the case property animals rules in 2017 and the livestock market rules in 2017 as well. We also went uh, to approach the Delhi High Court for actually for, for getting the pet trade regulated. Till now we had no regulation for pet sales in India. You could open up a shop and sell anything you wanted. Uh, and from under the counter, you could you know, sell a few turtles and a couple of snakes here and there and some endangered birds, nobody cared because once you're running a pet shop, people come with all kinds of exotic demands, people want the rarest of animals and then they want to uh, place orders and then the poachers are contacted and then animals are poached on order. So um, we have now uh, been able to, you know, through our uh, litigation and by, you know, obviously uh, working with the government proactively, because these are not antagonistic uh, litigations. These are just to bring the matter to a table where we are able to speak with the government. Otherwise, nobody is willing to even talk about them. Animals don't vote, so they are not important. So um, through those, we, we got our dog breeding rules 2017 and also the pet shop rules 2017 which are yet to be enforced so we are back in about six high courts now trying to get these laws enforced and back to supreme court as well again for the enforcement uh, i i believe that courts have declared uh, in india as guardians of animals uh, uh, earlier as well and we hold them to their word One second, Karnika, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, um, yeah, I think I, I'll take over from here. So um, thank you so much, uh, Gauri Mama and Mr. Duncan. Um, since we are left with only five minutes, uh, we have some questions in the Q&A box and uh, I think I'll, I can take up one of them. So uh, it is to Miss Maleki. So, uh, one of your most notable achievements involved rescuing 6,000 animals from the flooded Kedarnath region. What difficulties arose while dealing with such disasters and how did this shape our future national policy? So, I'll make it quick so that you can take one question with Duncan also. I have been, uh, uh, I, I don't know, my relationship with the equines has been... Uh, it, they just come to, to me. We, I even run uh, an equine rescue center in Uttarakhand. But way back in 2013, we came to know that there's a sudden uh, flash flood in, uh, in the hills and uh, some 6,000 equines were stuck. Um, well, we, uh, we launched our small effort, which had to you know, snowball into a big one right there, uh, impromptu. We were not disaster management specialists, but we uh, somehow managed to keep our team alive, to keep ourselves 
uh, safe while evacuating every last of those equines from the hills. Mm -hmm. uh, the government obviously tried to resist, uh, did not want to uh, want us to get, get ourselves killed. Um, when, they, when they saw that we wouldn't uh, relent, they offered support, which we did not take at that time. Uh, but later, we asked for the National Disaster Management uh, Plan to be amended and to include animals, whether it's a situation of drought, floods, famine, or anything. Animals must be included. Uh, that was well taken. And now the Disaster Management Authority is in the uh, process of revising their uh, entire plan, although the disaster is right here upon us, <laughs> but uh, it's a different kind of, uh, of, a, of a disaster. And um, thankfully, the animals are not affected. Uh, but uh, the act will now envisage uh, specific departments of the government to do their own uh, you know, work, especially animal husbandry, forest, uh, are to actively and proactively have uh, not only drills, but also at the time of disaster to have budgets to rescue these, uh, you know, uh, wildlife or livestock, whatever uh, is uh, to be rescued. We're still struggling on who to pin street animals to. So that's a bit of a thing. We're still talking to them. The, those amendments are in process, um, but um, it's, it's definitely led to something. It was not a one-off, thing, although it, it, it was a turning point in my life in many ways, we can talk about it later, but uh, that 19, uh, 2013 disaster has led to good things in terms of legislations. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, okay, uh, I think I can take up one question with Mr. Duncan. So, uh, Parnika is asking, um, Mr. Duncan, uh, we want to know something about your recent liaisons with the UK government. Can you shed some light on that? Uh, yes, have you got several hours? Because we'll need that. Um, well, look, as I said, we've been really close to government and we have been pressing as hard as we think is responsible and proper. You, you know, there are always other issues that intrude, but we've stayed uh, close on it and hard with it. Um, do you know how we started with our first meeting with government years ago? It was this. We, you, you, you can imagine that the horrors for Asian elephants are, if you're going to mount a, a really big campaign, are very much image-led. The horrors for these beautiful creatures who, in their natural and healthy state, are extraordinarily photogenic, um, but when broken down and brutalised, uh, look so awful, sound awful, it's it's a really sad experience. We started by showing them this. This is a ankus or bull hook, which is routinely used to stab and torment um, Asian elephants, baby elephants, um, in all their most sensitive parts. And this tragically is a uh, is a a, uh, an, a a version used for special religious or um, cultural occasions. Can you imagine it? It's got the image of a little elephant on it and the most fearsome of hooks. Um, of course, government, in fairness to them and, and all other constituencies, even of the most um, considerable standing and, and uh, you know, well-informed, knew very little of this, very little. So we started with that, but we've had uh, ever more uh, intensive discussions with them, and they have focused around, of course, all the key issues, the enormous upswell of opinion as, 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 as uh, real public awareness floods out onto the streets and across social media, and at what we really want and need, and what the government not only must say to its uh, counterparts in India, Thailand, Myanmar, Vietnam, uh, Sri Lanka, and so on, but what they must do within our own shores. And generally, they, they've certainly been very receptive. We're grateful for that. Um, and we believe uh, things are changing. What they know and what we know is that there is really one thing above all others that holds in its hands the prospects of survival for the Asian elephants and its social media. Because tragically, um, 
social, without social media, many of these endangered wildlife species have very, very bleak prospects of survival. But with it, and its intensive, relentless, thoughtful use, they really do. It can really change this. And um, government know that perfectly well. Uh, and they know these things about the transposability of legislation of the sort that we're now talking to them about all the time. What we're trying now to do at STAY is to shift the focus not to if there will be legislation, but when, when, when will it be? Uh, and of course, it's a long process. You don't just, you know, have a Department of State trotting into Parliament uh, laying a bit of paper forward and it becomes law. There are many steps and with it there are many perils. Uh, but that's why this issue must be maintained in the public eye and we must all focus on it, the reasons for it and so on. We hope very much the travel industry will turn the corner, the major parts of it, and work with us for new law, not against us. They're a mighty lobby, as I've said. Um, some of the, let, let's take Expedia, for example, its annual turnover is $100 billion. And there are many others in tens of billions. Now, if they want to carry on in the way they have, it takes a lot to shift them. But uh, we believe, really, if, they, um, if any of these companies want to continue um, uh, peddling these terrible places any longer, they deserve a very heavy fall. They really do, and, and we don't wish that to happen. Uh, they've had difficulties, obviously, in, since lockdown, and we want to work with them to see that there is new law, that they have time to prepare for it, that the public understands why it has to come in, and that is, it is relentlessly enforced if it has to be. And quite rightly, as Maleki says, um, that the sanctions must mean something to the offender, not a slap on the wrist. Uh, and it's no good anymore having uh, blandishments uh, from the travel industry in place of real law and hard sanctions that are enforced. And I would say graduating upwards in the sanctions. Not that you can breach, breach and breach again without consequence. There should be, as there are for many important uh, items of legislation in our jurisdiction and beyond, personal consequences for the directing officers of the company. And ultimately, something we're looking at, sequestration of assets. The purpose is not to dismantle and pull down travel companies. It is to make sure they pay attention and they do what they're told to do, as we all must under the law, for a very good reason. And they can carry on with their uh, elephant tourism. In fact, we are very supportive of that. We believe that ethical elephant tourism may well be the key to the future survival of the species. It, everything has to work for a living. And if and, in, and to the extent that the natural habitats of the elephants in any of the range states are constantly under pressure of reckless development and, and, and so on, uh, and that therefore they have to be protected in sanctuaries that are properly policed uh, and that uh, are consistent with security and safety for everyone, well then so be it. Uh, and why on earth not should those companies who invest uh, with hopefully government help in, in, in maintaining, uh, in, in establishing or, or maintaining those uh, places, uh, not benefit from them if they're doing good by the elephants. You know, in India, there are enormous parcels of land, huge, almost the size of the British Isles, that are designated as reserve forest lands. They are sitting idle, awaiting a purpose in life. Many of them, um, some are not suitable climatically or in terms of forestation uh, for receiving elephants, but many, many are. This is another area that Stay has spoken to the Indian government about uh, and which they should be doing something about. Uh, to receive these elephants. Um, how long more is India going to allow this perfect storm of dangers in these unethical venues where fetid and broken down 
um, the elephants are put in direct contact with humans and with um, uh, you know their mahouts, their, their their trainers and so on, um, to the deadly danger of both. It's reckless and mad, and it will do India no good in the estimation of the world if it were to just carry on with that. So we hope that these great forces at work themselves will. Uh, inspire uh, the Indian government and others to realign, rethink its priorities, think again uh, about not just, frankly, what's good for the elephants, but what, what is good for India and its people. Um, and, and so we hope, you know, we hope for that. In the meantime, stay, you know, is carrying on very, very busily with what we really feel we know we can deliver without the contingency of a buy-in from uh, Mr. Modi or, or any of the other heads of state um, or heads of government. Um, so, so, so that's where we, we are going. We, we enjoin everyone, especially on this Earth Day, to please help stay if you want to join us you know um, forgive me for making a plug but we need bright young people who may they they are the ones not old people like me they are the ones who have the future of the species in their hands and they are the ones who maybe or their children will be the we hope not but we have to say it maybe the last ever to see an elephant in the wild we don't want that and, and we need numbers and we need activity. Um, we have fa fabulous people from former heads of government uh, down to people like me um, working at Stay. And we, we need a lot more lawyers and uh, conservationists, but people with real fire. Uh, one thing Stay doesn't have is money uh, because we've generated, sought to drive up awareness rather than drive up funds. None of us takes a penny from stay and we would never dream of it, uh, but we think we get a lot done and cover a lot of ground and we need more people who are willing to give their time. We all have other jobs, which is immensely helpful uh, in, in, in uh, getting things done fast. If they say, if you want something done fast, give it to a, a busy man or woman. Well, that's, that's, that's often true. Um, and so we make no apologies for asking people to help us, whether they sign the petition or whether they write to their member of parliament or to the key government minister, who's Lord Goldsmith, um, uh, or, or simply to spread the word for us. We're not the only uh, entity doing work here. There's some fabulous uh, people working in different charities and so on, uh, and we support them in every way we can. But it's a desperately important time. It now that the numbers of elephants must not dip below a certain level where they simply are not sustainable. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Duncan. Now, I just ask Arjun to give a vote of thanks to the speakers. Um, yes, thank you so much, uh, Ms. Gauri Malik, for coming and uh, shedding, your, uh, shedding some light on what India has to offer for the protection of the welfare of the IUC and the listed species. We're so happy to have you and, uh, uh, you know, get to know more and our attendees may be having some questions. So I think uh, Aditi has already uh, directed them. Thank you, Mr. McNair for actually coming and shedding some light on the foundation you have uh, established. It's uh, both of you are doing amazing work as we know it. And um, the animals do form an amazing part and most substantial part of our ecosystem. And we hope that uh, this event might help educate a lot of attendees and students to uh, know that this is the main motive behind what the Earth Day 2021 motive of restoring our Earth actually means. It's protect protecting the animal welfare. Thank you both for actually coming and shedding some light. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been a real pleasure and a privilege to speak to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, Tiffany, Aditi, and Pranika. It was an honor to speak to you, Mr. Speak with you, Mr. Duncan. No. You too. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank you all as well on behalf of AILA, um, the student ambassadors, for all the work that you've done to pull this together, especially honoring Earth Day. Um, it's definitely been very timely. And thank you to both of our speakers. Um, it's been emotional and um, very insightful to learn about both of your work. And um, I really do hope that we will spark some interest. And I know we will amongst our attendees to um, you know, sign the petitions, to get involved, to write about these topics, 
um, to get them into the blogs, to get them into the journals, which is um, really crucial, I think, for the, the development of the movements. Um, so thank you all so, so much for being with us today. And um, I hope you have a lovely Earth Day. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Thanks so much. And to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.